everyone. And uh, today we're having a webinar on uh, the Guinness Connections. And actually, the one thing that you should do at some, some point, because it's very, um, it's always been of interest to us and amusing, is the Guinness ads. If you actually go onto YouTube and look at the Guinness ads over the years, there was some fantastic imagery, uh, very innovative, very creative. And one of my favorites, which I actually look at from time to time, is one called the Sapeur, and it was about a community in Congo who sort of like work all day, but then at nighttime they would dress up and put on their finery and their walking canes and dance and um, you you saw them drinking Guinness and in fact uh, just earlier uh, Ashley was telling us about how popular uh, Guinness is in West Africa and Nigeria but um, I know it's it's very popular in uh, East Africa as well and in fact all over the world so um, what we're going to do is we're going to kick off with um, meeting um, a member of the Guinness family and we're going to uh, meet Selena Guinness who's a writer, a feminist, a sheep farmer. She's going to tell you more about the lambing as well. And she's also a lecturer in Irish literature at the Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Dunleary. And Arthur Guinness was her, now I have to get this right, her great, 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 great grandfather. Is that right, Selena? Uh, yeah, that's right. She's and uh, the family have always lived in Tibrat. And in fact, um, how we, um, you know, were introduced to Selena was through a, a book that she wrote that was really interesting and a fantastic cover. Um, I unfortunately didn't have time to run home, but I was hoping to show the cover of the book. Brilliant, yes. <laughs> It's, it's a really interesting read because it, it tells you the truth of what it's like really living in a grand country house. Uh, it's not always, um, you know, as wonderfully easy as we think, and, and, and it's a very amusing. But um, so uh, Tibran is in the Dublin Mountains and she lives there with her husband, who's also an academic, uh, and uh, both farm sheep. In uh, 2012, she wrote her memoir, The Crocodile by the Door, which was shortlisted for the Costa Book Awards and the Board Gosh Energy Irish Book Awards. And she's also a published Yates scholar. So this will be of interest for people, not only, um, you know, who love the Guinness connection and know the importance of the Guinness for Ireland, you know, throughout the centuries, but also um, Irish literature. Uh, and especially because Irish literature, you know, every a decade it becomes more and more acknowledged throughout the world and she also has strong interest in James Joyce, Elizabeth Bone, occult modernism and contemporary Irish poetry and uh, you've just completed a, another novel, well a new novel set in uh, Budapest as well Selena. So you're very welcome and thank you thank very, very much, much. Uh, for agreeing to uh, come on the webinar today. Well thank you very much and thank you so much for introducing me in a very generous fashion. Um, it's delightful to be here and to meet everyone. Um, I am aware that, you know, um, your clients may be interested in to Braden from a number of points of view. Um, we live in a slightly less than grand house, I would say. It's, it's certainly a historic house. Uh, it's one where the cracks are fully on show. And I suppose what really makes where we live special is our situation. So we, we farm about 100 acres in the Dublin mountains. We are probably the last farm, uh, close, we are the farm closest to the city, I would say. Um, and in fact, the other farm that is very close is another Guinness property up, up near the Phoenix Park. Um, and our sheep basically um, graze sloping fields, looking out over Dublin Bay and the Pigeon Towers. The Pigeon House and Hoth Head beyond. So we have this fantastic view and our sheep are very unprofitably grazing prime development land. So my book, The Crocodile by the Door, effectively explored this tension between wanting to continue to conserve a way of life that is, if you like, slightly grubby, um, slightly shambolic, full of history, full of heritage. Um, and on land that was um, basically prime development land through the Celtic Tiger. And the book explores, I suppose, my relationship with various property developers who wish to buy my land. Um, I still own the land. Um, and uh, so it, it, encounter, it, it, it describes that encounter. So maybe that uh, kicks us off and um, I can talk a little bit more about the Guinnesses if you would like to share the videos. Uh, yes, I'm just having a little issue here. Sandra, are you able to do that? Start with the first one. Um, Sandra, no mic. 
Okay. Yeah. So we have a little storm at the moment um, mm. hitting Geo. She's based in us in the, the hidden heartlands of Ireland at the moment down in that loan. So uh, Sandra will be sharing the video Let from me her just computer. Try it, something else. Oh, I think I got it. Okay. Mm. Great. Great. If I, yes, we can. Lovely. So I wanted to begin. This is in our hallway. And I wanted to just to begin with this shot to show you here Arthur Guinness's eldest son, um, who uh, was Hosea Guinness. Um, and Hosea has strong St. Patrick's connections. Um, so that little glimpse was of um, um, Arthur's eldest son from whom we're directly descendants. So, descended. so he's a, a, a clergyman who um, procreated massively, he had loads of kids. Um, so he's sitting in our hall and hopefully we are going to have another little video that gives you a bit more of an idea of our setting. Yeah, I've got that one ready now. I did. Here we are. So it's a stormy day. So this is our um, this is our big Victorian house built in 1860. It's actually a house composed of two halves. The back section is actually a mill house in the 18th century. It was a mill house for a silk mill. And here is the um, our here is the front hall, and we have here two brothers, uh, Charles and James Butler. Um, both painted in 1810, and uh, that is James, and his brother over here, who looks rather magnificent, is Charles, who is the first Marcus Ormond, and they were recently restored, and, and so are, yeah, the two men are looking rather handsome. Um, the hall is um, a small Italianate hall, um, and underneath uh, uh, James, we have the crocodile that I wrote about, which was shot in the 1880s down at the um, meeting of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. We're going to go into the dining room now where I can just show you um, here uh, a, a, a room that has been used for a number of different productions, film productions recently. Um, and in fact, two days ago, we had a, a location guide come up to look at it for rather oddly for Eugene O'Neill's um, long day's journey into night. So we'll have to see whether that comes to pass. And we have a couple more ancestors there. Um, the way that I tend to do tours is to tell the history of Ireland through the portraits on the walls and to try and complicate this sense of history that we have. So we're going to go back out and into the drawing room. These areas of the house have not been redecorated since my grandmother had the house in the 1930s. And she had to use paints that um, uh, were used to paint aircraft. Um, but apart from all the miniatures and the, the little portraits, there's also a small painting here on the chair, which is by a Cubist artist called May Guinness, who was quite a famous Irish modernist artist. And indeed, when she died, she left all her money to St. Patrick's Cathedral, much to my family's regret. So there is a link there with St. Patrick's Cathedral. So this just gives you an idea, if you like, of the house. Um, it is ripe for redecoration. I do like to show off my uh, three pin plugs and the fact that the roof is now solid. So that might give you an idea. So a few other things then that I could talk to your clients about are Yeats and James Joyce and um, other Irish literary figures. And I have a particular interest in uh, how they dabbled in occultism and magic. And yeah, it, it's uh, interesting because he used to, um, Yeats used to use the rider, um, the tarot cards as well. That's right, uh, that's yeah. right. Um, and in fact, the pack that he designed was marvelously designed by someone called Pixie Coleman Smith, who in fact had strong, uh, who, who grew up in, in Jamaica as far as I'm aware. Um, so um, the one thing about occultism is, is it's vastly transcultural. Um, it uh, pulls in people from all sorts of places, from Madame Blavatsky from Russia, um, Colonel Olcott from America and a few others. So um, through these kind of weird connections, uh, Yeats really kind of developed his own philosophies about history and about poetry. So I'd be very happy to talk to your clients about these great figures. Fantastic. And you also have a farm, don't you, Selena? We do have a farm. Yeah. So we farm about a flock of about 70 yos who are due to lamb at Easter. And um, occasionally we have had people who help us out in the lambing shed over the Easter break. It won't be everyone's cup of tea, but um, for anyone who does wish to see, um, well, to help out, um, which can get be as 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 much at a distance as people want, but um, 
we we do we lamb uh, we lamb about sixty five days um, and uh, we just farm sheep at the moment. There used to be cattle here, but uh, we decided we should farm something that wouldn't kill us. Yeah, and um, I'm sure the lambing doesn't take uh, take um, doesn't take place between nine and five in the daytime. No, <laughs> no, it's it, no. They tend to well, actually, mind you, they, I think the, the the peak hour is about six o'clock in the morning, so you do have to yeah. be up early. But if anyone wants to bottle feed cute lambs, we can certainly do that from April and May. So there is an invitation for anyone who wants a different type of vacation in Ireland, helping to uh, lamb uh, sheep and uh, also to feed them then afterwards. Um, yeah. um, so you um, do lecture, so uh, you can do private visits at certain times by arrangement uh, with clients. So it's on request. Um, and uh, it's wonderful that you have so many areas of interest for clients, both the literature, the historical house, you know, the, the famous um, Guinness family, and then uh, the farming element of it as well, because the clients do love getting back to nature. And it's a beautiful part of Dublin. Um, so thank you very much, Selena, for joining us. Just got a quick video of the sheep and the views. Oh, yes, you should yeah. show that. Thank you. <laughs> Yep, so here is our very uh, hybrid flock of sheep. Um, and it shows you the proximity to Dublin there and the old lime tree in the center of the field. And one of the things that I do quite enjoy doing is showing people around the farm and explaining why the landscape is the way it is and also the kind of forestry that we planted recently. We planted 14 hectares of deciduous forestry in 2007, which is now beginning to kind of look rather glorious. So. It's a great area actually for exploration, including the Health Art Club locally, and then of course up on the feather beds up on the top of the Dublin Mountains. So all of that can be encompassed as well in a tour. A great hill walking country. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, really. The Wicklow it opens up on. We're right kind of yeah. on the Wicklow Way. Yeah. Fantastic. So thanks a million, Selena. Thank you very much, Siobhan. I wish you the best of luck, everyone, and I hope to see you in Ireland soon. Thank you. So and we're going to pass on to Karen. So Karen must be tearing her hair out at this stage because how many days left is countdown now to the opening in Cashel Palace? Oh, we have six sleeps left, Siobhan. Six, <laughs> six sleeps. sleeps. <laughs> we're, we're on the on the countdown here uh, to opening our beautiful hotel next Tuesday, 1st of March. Wow. Yep. So, uh, yeah, it's it's exciting. It's exciting. We're moving beds in and moving furniture around and the artwork has gone up. So it's it's incredible to see it all coming together. It's very, very exciting. Fantastic. And it's great news for Ireland as well, having such a prestigious, um, you know, name such as Relais Chateau opening a new property, uh, especially now that, you know, COVID hopefully is fading away in the background. So it's a sign of good things to come. Uh, we think so. We think we're very lucky to be kind of emerging out of our renovation into this, you know, positive future where everybody's picking up their suitcases again and they're ready to set sail. So we're, we're very lucky, I suppose, yeah. to be opening now in March and to be uh, getting so many nice inquiries. Um, and we're looking forward to taking care of them all uh, here in Cashel over the next few months. So and it's lovely to be here with everybody um, this evening. So thanks to Siobhan and Gio and everybody, our friends at Adams and Butler for a lovely invite. Um, I love talking about the hotel and I love telling our Guinness story. And it was great to learn a little more from Selena and to see her beautiful house as well. Um, so I'll share a little about the hotel and I have um, our Guinness connections to share as well. So I share the presentation from here, Karen? Uh, no, I can do it from here All if you right. like, Theo. Well, well, if it worked from here, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep you on back up. Uh, let's see if it'll work for me. Um, here we go. Yeah. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Hopefully I can move it on now, though. That's the only thing. Let's see. I think I need to... Oh, yeah, here we go. So to get it to move to, to the next. Oh, yeah, perfect. Great. We go. There we go. So uh, March 2022, as mentioned, next Wednesday. Drum roll, please, everybody. Uh, we're inching ever closer to our opening. And as uh, Siobhan very kindly mentioned, we are very lucky to be a Relais and Chateau property, uh, which is a fantastic international affiliation for us. And we're also members of Ireland's Blue Book, which is a fantastic collection of uh, privately owned houses and very nice restaurants um, all over Ireland. Um, so just in terms of our location, I'll pop this down out of the way for a moment. 
just so you can get a sense of where we are. Uh, I suppose we like to kind of say that we're in the heart of Ireland, we're in Tipperary. Uh, you've probably heard the song, it's a long way to Tipperary, but my new mission in life is to dispel that notion. It is not a long way to Tipperary. We're in the middle of everything and we're very easy to get to. And we're in a lovely, beautiful town called Cashel. Um, we're very near uh, Cork and Shannon airports within an hour of those and um, under two hours from Dublin airport. Uh, so really easy to get to us. The town of Cashel itself is really quaint and charming. There's less than 5,000 in terms of population. So it's really nice and intimate, easy to get around. Um, and I suppose we would, and not only do we have this beautiful medieval monument here on our doorstep, but I suppose the, the beauty of the property is, among many things, is that it is a town center uh, property. So guests, if they're self-driver, if they're private chauffeur drive coming to us via Adams and Butler, um, it's easy for them to just, you know, leave the car and uh, leave the driver for the night and amble downtown themselves. But yet at the same time, we've got three acres of gardens at the back overlooking the Rock of Cashel. So it does still feel like a nice, peaceful retreat at the end of a long day sightseeing. So this just gives you an overview of the property itself. It's 25 acres in total, including all the gardens at the back. And um, the original house was built in 1732. And our proprietors, the Magner family, bought this in 2015 and commenced on a multi-year and multi-million renovation project. And we've since renovated all of these beautiful outbuildings here into accommodation options, a gate lodge, a carriage house, schoolhouse. The original house has been fully renovated. We've added a new garden wing on and uh, we've built a beautiful uh, state-of-the-art spa as well and a function room to the side. So lots to offer. This is just a recap. It doesn't look like this today, I can tell you. Um, the artwork has just gone up in this beautiful lobby today and it's, um, it's really looking fantastic. But it is a listed building. As I've mentioned, it was built in 1732 for the Archbishops of Cashel. So there's a long, long history here and we've been very meticulous with retaining that while adding to the, to the splendor of the hotel and making sure that it has all the luxury modern amenities that everybody would want. Um, in terms of accommodation, it's still a boutique style property, 42 rooms in total, but a really very nice selection of sizes and suites and different options, some outer connecting for families, um, and some really, really nice interconnecting suites and superiors as well. So uh, the team at Adams and Butler will be able to advise you, of course, uh, as to what will suit best, as will we via them. So there's loads of options here for families and for individuals. So we have a lovely spa, as I've mentioned, a little bit of R&R &R in the evening. Um, and even if your guests don't have time maybe for a treatment we will have a yoga room where we'll run virtual or in-person yoga and pilates in the mornings and we do have two outdoor seaweed baths at the end of the deck here so they're only 30 minutes um, and they can have them in the evening as a little soak overlooking our gardens which is a nice way to unwind food is going to be a Karen, huge Karen yep. can I just stop you there for one second um just a question came in about golf courses like besides Tipperary and Dundrum house yeah. casual what other ones will be in the vicinity oh i have a pdf in a few minutes about oh, golf perfect, perfect. Um, and the distances so i'll show you those um yeah we're quite near a few of the the bigger ones well well within an hour when i say we're quite near but nowhere as far from a hel with a helicopter as you'll see from my slide we've done all the timings for people as well to get there by helicopter so i'll show you that shortly um, just to go back on the food, it's a huge, huge focus for our executive head chef, Stephen Hayes. Um, we're really lucky in our location. I mean, everywhere in Ireland really is, is a wonderful food destination. We have some of the best, we'd like to think, food in the world. Um, and here in Tipperary, we're lucky. It's called the Golden Vale because we have some of the best farmland in the country. Um, we're sourcing a lot of our food locally, as you can imagine. Um, and we'll have a lot of options. For a small boutique hotel, I think we're really lucky. We've got four kitchens, a number of dining outlets, including our fine dining restaurant, which is in the original Bishop's Pottery Cellar. Um, we'll have afternoon tea in our Queen Anne room and breakfast. We've, as you can see here, the Guinness bar, which I'll talk about now in a minute, our cocktail bar, private residence cocktail bar, garden terrace for food, spa terrace, a ballroom terrace, like loads and loads of options for dining. We also have Mikey Ryan's, that's already open. It's a beautiful gastro pub. And at the back of Mikey Ryan's, we have this lovely secret garden for barbecues or private events or family dinners. And we have a lovely glass well as well, which is a private, effectively a private glass box that seats 12 people. A lovely option winter or summer because it opens up fully 
for dining for a family celebrating something special and coming on stream is our very own Donahue's traditional Irish pub so it is a real traditional Irish pub that we uh, existed here in the town and it links onto the back of our secret garden here and we're renovating that fully at the moment so that'll be open soon as well. And then just about Guinness, as I mentioned, we have the glass well there, and that has an original well um, in the grounds, uh, which was a well dating back to the original property. So the original property was built for uh, the Archbishop Arthur Price, who lived in the house from 1744, as you can see, to 1752. And he had a land agent by the name of Richard Guinness. Um, who moved from Kildare down here to Cashel to take care of the Archbishop and to brew his ale. And um, the glass well, as I said, has the, the original well from where they got the water for that. And Richard Guinness's son uh, na was named after the Archbishop. So he was his godfather. So he named him Arthur, Arthur after the Archbishop. And when the Archbishop passed away, he bequeathed Arthur and his father Richard £100 each. And Arthur used his to um, set up his 9,000 year lease in St. James's Gate in Dublin. So we like to think we, we set the, the ball rolling here in Cashel while the first pint might not have been brewed here. Certainly the precursor, the first ales and so on were definitely brewed here. And we have some lovely um, history to test to that. And on site, of course, in the hotel down in the cellar is our Guinness bar. So that was here originally in the hotel for many years. And we are currently finalizing the renovation of that. And we're really looking forward to welcoming people back. It'll be a nice, busy, vibrant bar with the best of the best Guinness, hopefully. Um, so it's really nice to have those links and to maintain that history as we move forward. Um, so just in terms of things to do, and again, you're really in the best hands there with Siobhan and the team, they'll build the best itineraries for you, but uh, so you know what is here on our doorstep in Tipperary, we're very lucky. Um, equestrian is going to be a huge focus for us. Our owners are the Magner family and they're, they are quite globally famous for famous stallions and racehorses and they own Coolmore Stud and Ballydoyle Racing here. So we do have private access to those facilities and we can set up, we're going to have a dedicated equine concierge on property who can book horse riding and various activities for you. Of course, history and culture here is, you know, everywhere. We're very lucky in Ireland to have that. Lots of outdoor pursuits, hill walking, kayaking, fishing. We have three miles of private fishing here along the River Shore. Um, food I've mentioned is a huge thing for us. We have a lot of artists and producers on our doorstep and they're all very welcoming in terms of doing private tours with them or indeed coming to the hotel to give a little chat about their produce. Um, uh, the Irish pubs with plenty of those here in the town that you won't be short to them and spa and wellness of course is another focus for us. Here's the golf um, as Siobhan mentioned earlier. So Dundrum is the closest one to us. It's, it's uh, 13 kilometers or eight miles over the road. Um, Mount Juliet which is hosted the Irish Open is within an hour, Adair Manor is within an hour, that's going to be home to the Ryder Cup in 2027. Drumoland Castle is 80 minutes from us, Fota Island, um, again another Irish Open host, 60 minutes, and the K Club is about 90 minutes from us. So these are the distances we've done by car, as per Google Maps, our good friend, and these are the distances by helicopter, if anybody would like to uh, get those. So a little further afield, then we have some more links courses as well. Again, we've done the distance to them by car and again by helicopter. So nowhere is too far from us uh, in a helicopter, or indeed in a car really in Ireland. They're not too far to get to them. And then another reason why uh, Tipperary is a good base, uh, as I said, we're very, very central. We're in the heart of Ireland and it's very easy to do day trips to some of the nice sightseeing. So it is a bit of a luxury not to have to pack up every day. So if your clients wanted to stay a few extra nights, they'll be very easily able to do a really good itinerary as planned by the guys at Adam the Butler for you um, and take you there to Cork, Kilkenny, Waterford and even to Dublin if they wanted to stay. And Karen, you're a perfect stop when people are leaving Dublin. Like say for example, yeah. people come early into the airport in Dublin, they don't want to, you know, pay to guarantee an early check-in. Mm -hmm. So you can travel on down to yourselves, to the first night with yourselves, yeah. and then maybe do Dublin when they're leaving Ireland. But then from yourselves, they can go to Kerry, they can go to Cork or wherever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're we're very we're two under two hours from Dublin Airport. So if they're coming in on one of the many early flights, then that's perfect. They can come down to us. 
Um, they can use the spa facilities in the morning in the event that their bedrooms aren't ready. Of course, we'll do our best to try and get them ready as early as we can, but they'll be able to relax in the spa anyway. They'll be able to have a breakfast or an afternoon tea or something um, or do some of the sightseeing. They can go up to the Rock of Cashel. We have private access through the garden up to the Rock of Cashel, which you can see here in this Forbes magazine picture. Uh, all of the bedrooms at the back of the hotel overlook the Rock of Cashel. It's lit up at night. So, you know, um, that's something nice to maybe do on the morning of arrival so it can free up the rest of their stay to do other things perhaps in the evening and we'll be able to take care of them obviously if they come in early so yeah that's a really good option when they fly in um, and then they can set sail for the rest of beautiful Ireland so um, yeah so these are just a few mentions we've been very lucky recently I suppose being the the newest kid on the block coming into the luxury scene here in Ireland we're very lucky we've got some beautiful mentions in Forbes and Condé Nast and and more to follow. Um, hopefully next week we're getting our high res, our photographers are on site at the moment, <laughs> taking all the imagery. So as soon as we've got our fleet of high res images, um, we'll hope to get a lot more exposure as well. So and this is our team, um, myself and our, our GM, Adrian and Seamus, our, our very own Prince Harry, as we're calling him these days. And yeah, he our, does look very like yeah. him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's very like Prince Harry. So, uh, yeah, and Stephen, of course, is taking care of all of the food and a lot more. There's a big team here. There's about 200 staff, I think, um, on, on board. So that's a lot for a 42-bed hotel. So, yes, it will be well, well, well taken care of. Um, and we can't wait to welcome everybody. Fantastic. Thanks a million, Karen. So the best of luck now uh, with those six sleeps. And hopefully you'll be catching the <laughs> sheep. <laughs> Thank you, Siobhan. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks a lot. So now let's go over to St. Patrick's Cathedral and talk to Louis and find out how that Guinness money was spent, amongst other things. Thanks, Siobhan. And, and indeed to, to all the team, Alan and Butler, for the, the very kind invitation to talk to you today. And best of luck to Karen and her colleagues with the, the opening of the, the Cashel Palace next week. I, I was down that way quite recently and it looks amazing. So I can't wait to see, see it when it's open. So my name is Louis Parmenter. I'm the Cathedral Manager and the Dean's Verger here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And uh, I look forward to telling you a little bit about the Cathedral, some of its many links with the Guinness family and then some of the offers we can do for your clients and visitors. So um, I think we'll start with just a short video highlighting our behind the scenes tour, which is really aimed at groups of up to six people. And uh, you have that there. So that's just a little taster of, of one of the, the, uh, the VIP offers we do, and I'll come back to them uh, near, near the end. So I, I should mention there's been a church here since we believe the fifth century. We have links with Patrick, who's said to have baptized people into the, the Christian faith on the site. And uh, the current building was built between 1220 and 1259. Um, obviously, too much history to go into in in this in this time but we we cover a lot of it on on our tour by by the middle of the 1860s the cathedral had fallen into a, a very poor state of repair 
and Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness, who was the head of the brewing family at that time, stepped in to save the family from almost certain ruin. So work commenced in 1861, and then by 1865, that the majority of that was completed. Um, his family continued to support the cathedral. Um, his eldest son, uh, Arthur, another Arthur Guinness, Lord Ardalon, uh, diverted the River Poddle, which actually flowed underneath the building until 1880. So a huge engineering project at the time. And uh, it included lowering the floor of the cathedral then to sort of remove a lot of the damp stone. And um, they uh, laid beautiful Victorian tiles. The entire cathedral floor is covered in these tiles. Again, uh, a gift of, of Lord Ardalon. Um, he famously also gave St. Stephen's Green to the city and his statue can be seen on the west side of that wonderful park. His brother, Edward Cecil Guinness, um, is, uh, was uh, the first Earl of Ivy and again continued this amazing link and support of St. Patrick's. Um, in 1897, he gave us a new peal of bells and then in 1901, uh, gave the cathedral a new organ, um, which uh, was really another remarkable feat of engineering. The organ is over 4,000 pipes. Some of them are 32 feet long. In fact, so long that they had to build an additional roof on part of the building to accommodate. Um, so both the bells and, and that organ uh, are still in use today and we're, we're very proud of them and, and the people who, who use them. Um, again, uh, he, he also gave a park to the people of Dublin, beautiful St. Patrick's Park next door to us. And he founded what's known as the Ivy Trust, which is a wonderful public housing project here in, in Dublin. The links with the Guinness family continue um, at present. The Honourable Rory Guinness serves on the Cathedral Board. And uh, that there has been a Guinness on the board since the middle of the, the 19th century. So great link. And uh, I know Selena mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the bequest as well. So uh, huge support and, and uh, links there over the years. So in terms of what we can offer here for your, your clients and visitors, uh, as well as being a place of worship, we welcome hundreds of thousands of visitors each year and we can cater for uh, private group tours or VIP behind the scenes visits to the bell tower and the roof led by myself or one of the other vergers. There are three of us who lead those those tours and, you know, usually from two to six people for those. If there's more numbers, we can sort of split them in two and bring half up while we show the other half around downstairs. Um, we can also cater for after hour events, ranging from pre-dinner receptions, private recitals with the cathedral choir, or fully seated dinners, uh, small groups in the Lady Chapel, uh, or gala dinners for 200 people in the cathedral. So all of these events and, and the visitors who come to us um, enable us to continue to support this building that we're custodians of in the same way that the Guinness family have done over the generations. Um, we recently completed the re-roofing of the entire upper levels of, of the building, a new roof, lead works, lightning protection, and many other smaller projects as part of this huge 9.5 million investment in the cathedral and um, yeah part of that which I was very pleased was that we, we were able to offer improved access through the roof and, and some of those behind the scenes uh, access to, to, to your clients and uh, yeah look thanks for your time and can, attention. Can I ask you Louis can one ring the bells as you can in Christchurch? You can. We have now. It, it's quite a, a long and complicated story, as you can imagine. Bells to be rung, how how they start upside down. So there's about six weeks training and learning how to to ring a bell properly. But we have one bell hanging down all the time, so we can toll it, and we do offer that to to your your clients. Okay. 
And then you also have the wonderful Marsh's Library just beside you as well. Just next door, Ireland's oldest public library, founded just after 1700 by Archbishop Narcissus Marsh. Yeah, well worth the visit as well. And I think it'll probably be very popular now with Trinity College and the long room, you know, closing for that little while. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we're all excited to see that the rise in visitor numbers again after the last yeah. couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. But it's a all. lovely area. It's a lovely historic medieval part of Ireland as well. Like there's so much to see in that one little small area. So thanks a million, Louis, for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. So we're going to go to the west of Ireland now and we're going to uh, talk to Shane. And he's there in, with the lovely fire. And I'm, I'm guessing which suite you're in, Shane, in Ashford Castle. <laughs> Hi Siobhan, um, and thank you very much to you and Gio for, for having me. Um, yeah, I'm actually in uh, the Kennedy suite here in the Castle Siobhan, um, which is one of our stage rooms. Um, and I suppose given the fact that we're talking about the Guinness, uh, the Guinness family, the Guinness connection with the Ashford estate, I am in what would have been the Guinness, uh, Guinness residence um, of the castle. Um, but you know, Ashford itself, the Ashford estate has an incredibly rich and, and varied history. It dates back to, to 1228, which makes it the, the oldest castle hotel in Ireland. And while it's seen, um, you know, a number of wonderful owners over its over its time in existence, um, I suppose one of the more notable owners were certainly the Guinness family. Um, they purchased the estate back in 1852. Um, and when they purchased it, Sir, Sir Benjamin Lee Guinness um, sought to extend the estate, which ended up being 26,000 acres um, and developed, developed the estate, but also the grounds, the castle itself. And as a result, that provided huge local employment. And for those of you who have been uh, to the west of Ireland, who've been to Kong, where Ashford is located, um, you know, it's a small area, small rural west of Ireland area. So that was incredibly, incredibly welcome at the time. Um, but soon after the Guinness family purchased the estate, um, they became known for their, uh, their extreme generosity to the area, to the locality, and they became renowned as excellent employers. And back in the kind of mid to, to um, late 1850s, that certainly would have been a, quite an uncommon thing um, at the time. So we huge, we owe huge debt of credit, gratitude to the, the Guinness family for what we have here. Um, now on the Ashford estate. But I suppose in more recent years, um, back in 2013, the Ashford estate has seen owners who are very Guinness-esque in their style um, and have, have invested as significantly in the estate and in the property as the Guinness family would have. And they are the Tolman family um, of Red Carnation Hotels. They've invested upwards of 100 million US dollars into the property and very much brought the estate and the castle back to its former um, Guinness glory, I suppose you could call it. Um, but one thing I suppose, and again, for those of you who, who have been to Ashford, you will know that there's an incredible longevity of service here at the castle. So we say we have 800 years of history with 80 plus years of hospitality. And the reason we say that is obviously our history, but the fact that Within every single department here at Ashford Castle, you have a minimum of 80 years of service with any kind of two to three members of the team. And if you take Martin Gibbons, for example, who's our longest serving team member here at Ashford, Martin's father and grandfather both worked um, on the Guinness estate and he works here now and his two sons work on property with the Tolman family. So there's an amazing connection there uh, between the Guinness and the Tolman family. Um, but I suppose I mentioned the Guinness family and their generosity to the local community, to charitable efforts in the, in the locality, and the Tolman family are, are known for that as well. And as with the Guinness era um, here on the estate, there's an incredible, um, I suppose, sense of community that has continued over the years, um, and that's continued to this very day. So we all know what we've gone through over the last couple of years. Um, so in the last year or so, we created this concept of pubble. Um, and that's the Irish word for community. Um, and I suppose we've created a series of a series of videos um, to highlight the Ashford community, not just the people here on the estate, but the, the wider um, Ashford, Ashford area. 
um, and I suppose our suppliers, our partners. And I think Geo has a little video which shows you our executive um, chef, Philippe Farinu, with one of our uh, local suppliers, John Ward from Dune Castle Oysters, who are not that far over the road from us. But it just shows that sense of communities that we have here on the estate. So Geo, if you have that, I think we can play that whenever you're ready. Yeah, no, it's um, Parky Blood when you're growing up around here. Young fella, six months for us. Enjoy being around it. Like, if you move me inland away from the sea, I'll, I'd feel right out of place. It just wouldn't work for me. So. so, the first time I came in, I probably was in 2000, from Paris. We only worked with the tide. It tells me when I can come out here and it tells me when I have to go home. So, John came to me for his boy of the road when he was there, the NHA. And he said, and I said, okay, fantastic. So we started working with him. Cold? No, no, I just. Uh, it's a lot in your boat, no? No, it's just the cold, yeah, it's the cold. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all to do with elements, you know. We have to accommodate with the tides and the pines and storms, and it's our boss, it's our master, whatever way you want to look at it. They are local, so we have to support them. No, no, we support them because the produce is right. Yeah, you can have that one, I'll remove it for you. So when you speak to them, you need to see them. They, they love a little bit of what's going to happen. That is when they are eager to, to, to do better. Three foot waves hit me, back to me, and we're trying to get... Uh, Gio, uh, can you hire that sound? So not the nicest of the days, but you feel alive after it. Pretty tired, but definitely alive. I love what I do. I do because it's, it's not a job for me. So there you are. Sorry, I, I, I hope you at least got a sense of, um, of where we're located and, and the spectacular scenery that we have here um, around the actual estate. But that's it from me. Thank you so much for, for all of your support um, and indeed to Siobhan and her team for, for their continued support. I look forward to welcoming many more of your clients back to, back to Ashford Castle. Thanks, Mary Chain. Just before you go, it is like the one thing about Ireland that I think is very, very different. Like, you know, and, you know, um, it, you know, to to a lesser extent in um, Scotland as well. But we are very much, uh, you know, like every time you say even in the grand properties like Ashford or the grand property that Cashel will be in Adair and the smaller, wonderful properties like, you know, Hayfield and Caranan and, you know, the Marion Hotel, other places all around Ireland, we do tend to use a lot of local suppliers. And we're very proud of the fact that you know, we're supporting uh, the local community, like people talk of sustainability and it's sort of sometimes it's my bugbear that they talk about recycling and, you know, eco trails, etc. For me, sustainability is using local people in the community and supporting them and allowing them to live in these areas and their kids attend school and keep the schools open. So, um, you know, it's great um, that uh, you've got a wonderful property like Ashford that appreciates that and subscribes to that philosophy with your tread right uh, program and everything. Yeah, and this huge, you know, I, I'm very, very similar to Vaughan. I suppose that word sustainability is bandied around a lot. Um, but I think there's there's much more to it than recycling and all of that kind of stuff. It's all about kind of supporting, particularly in kind of smaller rural parts of Ireland, you know, supporting those smaller artisan producers um, who, who do depend so heavily on, on places like Ashford and the Ashford Estate. So absolutely couldn't agree more. Just Shane, I'm going to fire some questions at you. How many bedrooms and do you still have the Connacht room? Yeah, absolutely. So there's 83 rooms um, in the castle and we do, we absolutely have the Connacht room. The Connacht room would have been um, the dining room actually of the Guinness family. It's what we serve our afternoon tea and now on a, on a daily basis. It's absolutely still there and as beautiful as ever. Fantastic. 
So brilliant. Thanks so many, Shane. And thank you for joining us. And also, by the way, Shane was amazing during COVID, like the stuff he got up to for us. Besides brandishing his baby photos, he was down in cellars and basements with wolfhounds and cigar uh, bars and everything for us. So thanks so many for what you did during COVID. We, we became little movie producers here over the course of COVID. So uh, yeah, we're salespeople, but movie producers as well at the same time. <laughs> Well, we, we also had Karen, I always remember, at 3 a.m. in Vancouver doing a webinar with me uh, from Ireland. But uh, so great. Thanks a million, uh, Shane, as well. And now we're going to go over to Guinness Storehouse. And we're going to meet Ashley. And Ashley might be a newer face for some of you because she's just joined. You were saying five months ago, Ashley. Five months. Yeah. yeah. Not, not long in the job now. <laughs> yeah. And she came from uh, up from Belfast from the ICC. So some of you might know her from there. So it's great. Welcome to uh, down to Dublin. And uh, thank you for joining us, Ashley. So I'm going to let you uh, kick off there and I'll just meet my. Thank you very much, Siobhan. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time to come and learn about the Guinness legacy in Ireland today. Um, I think, you know, if without a doubt, the. The, the legacy that Guinness, the Guinness family left throughout the island of Ireland is fantastic. Um, and we like to think that we, we are the home of Guinness. We are where it all began. Um, so it, it's great to be able to talk to you a wee bit more about what we do. So I suppose, um, firstly, I always say is, regardless of where you are in the world, when you think of Ireland, there's many things you'll think of. But one thing that everybody will have in common is they'll think of a pint of Guinness. It is one of the most globally recognised drinks and it's unequivocally Irish. So um, we are the home of Guinness. We are where the brewery uh, started in the 1700s and where Sir Arthur Guinness in 1759 signed a lease for 9,000 years for St James's Gate for four acres of land. So that showed the commitment that he had to the drink. So for, for those who have been, haven't been fortunate enough to get over to see it, we do have a quick video that will kind of give you a bit of a glimpse into what, um, what the storehouse does. It takes you through the history of the history of Sir Arthur Guinness, the history of the family, the brewing process, the ingredients of it, the fantastic advertising floor, which is my personal favourite, um, and takes you through the, the Gilroy Zoo with the Tukens and the, the singing oysters and everything. So um, if if we could now, um, if Joe, that would be possible to show the storehouse, that would be great. Thank you so much. So it's a very quick glimpse into what we have, but your journey starts um, at the 9,000 year lease. It takes you right through the ingredients. You see waterfalls, you learn about why the barley must be roasted at 232 degrees. Um, you get to smell the barley. The tasting rooms are like something out of Willy Wonka. It really is good. Um, so that we have excellent restaurants on board. We have um, our more premium restaurants called 1837. And I noticed there, Siobhan, you, you pointed out the Guinness and oysters. So 1837 is the year when Guinness and oysters were first paired. Um, so this is our 1837 restaurants. And lastly, you finish with unbelievable views across Dublin. You're in our gravity bar. It's 360 degree views. You can see right across to the Wicklow Mountains and that's where we source our water daily for Guinness. We are still an active brewery um, where we brew, believe it or not, 3 million pints a day, just over there. Um, and so you are, you can feel, you can feel the history, the live, you can feel that the work that was being done in the 1700s is very much being done today. So in terms of what we deliver and what we offer for our more luxury clients, um, we have our obvious, we have our, our standard product is a self-guided tour. We do guided tours as well, which will be along with one of our beer specialists and they will take you through. They are so knowledgeable. I actually took my parents on it last, last week and they just... 
they just completely fell in love with it with the, their passion like that is what we sell as our people um we you saw yourself you can get your picture on a pint some people find this weird i think it's a bit of a bizarre concept but they love it um, and you can get into the guinness academy and you can get a certificate and learn how to pour your own pint by one of our um, beer specialists. And we are developing this, these products so that they can all be done exclusive and private as well. Um, so we will have both options as a public attendee and also as a private option. Another product that we have is what we call our connoisseur experience. So our connoisseur, it's, it's a hidden bar. It's highly popular, particularly with the US market. Um, once it goes live, it just gets snapped up. Uh, and in this, it's about a, a 60 to 90 minute experience with a beer specialist and they will take you through the portfolio of Guinness beers and they'll take you through the history of the beers, the tasting notes of the beers, um, and you can ask them anything you always want. We always try to say there's one of our, um, one of our beer specialists is called Podrick Fox, Foxy, uh, and we do have it as a hashtag if you can flummox Foxy. So we all try to find questions to find the answer that he does not know yet. Um, we've yet to get them. And going forward, which we're going to be launching live for this summer is going to be a, a private tour of the storehouse. So it can happen first thing in the morning. And we're also looking to, to understand when we get the evening availability. So you'll be able to come in and experience gravity at night. So it will be slightly more exclusive and it will be on a shorter lead time for booking, but we will be able to do the mornings at a longer lead time. And we hope to have those ready and out to market in April, May time. Um, another one that we're working on, and you know, as we've touched on with St. Patrick's Cathedral, it's the Guinness in Dublin walking tour. So this will start right through from when we look at the harp, um, and I can see there, Martha, you have a harp in the background. I appreciate, I appreciate this. Um, and that is, is that the correct way as well for Guinness? Um, so a fact is that the Guinness uh, the harp, if you look at the Irish government harp, it's the opposite way round to the Guinness harp. And this is because Guinness got the copyright first. So the Irish government aren't allowed to have their harp in the same way. Um, so these are those little, little facts that people leave, just feeling that little bit more immersed with the drink and a little bit closer to the drink um, and to the brand and to the history of it. Janice, so, I'm sorry, um, Ashley, can I ask you something? Janice has just asked, um can you give the person saying i'm presume she's talking foxies of course it's Podrick. i'll type it in here because it's it's an irish name so um Podrick fox um he is now he is our global brand ambassador um so he actually used to run one of our our, our one of our side, uh, side venue as such um, and that's the, called the Guinness Open Gate Brewery. Now I don't have a video on this just yet but I will be able to share some images through Siobhan and the team most certainly. Um, so the Guinness Open Gate Brewery is our experimental brewery um, and I was just there last weekend and I tried it was a raspberry and black pepper porter wow. and it was amazing. Um, and it's actually, believe it or not, it's where Hop House 13 came from. Yeah. So, um, and there you could get in, you could have a paddle. We're working on creating menus. So you can do a bit of an aperitif with um, a beer beer tasting alongside it. Um, so we do all ones. We've got like a mango and lime pie one, which is currently, um, currently brewing and it's due on tap in April. But you will be sitting here and behind you, I'd love to sense it in gravity and I am not. Um, but just behind you, you will actually see the beers all being brewed behind you. So you're so close. The brewers are walking behind you as they're creating these beers. And if they're good enough, they may one day be sold to the public. But it's the only place you can try the beers. And do you know what's interesting, Ashley, is that I um, was in the States doing sales calls the last few weeks. And there's a lot of harp. In the states the lager harp which was owned by guinness i assume it still is um and like that would have been very popular in my parents day as such but not like during my generation and then i was up in Belfast. i was in northern ireland for the last two days three days and um there's a lot of harp up there as well but um is there any element of harp in the guinness storehouse or 
Um, well, we would have our main ones that we would serve here. It's your Hop House 13 would be mm -hmm. our main beers um, because they are brewed here within St. James's Gate. Um, so within at the end of gravity, you do get a drink included. Um, you can obviously have your pint of beer, pint of Guinness and you've got your Guinness draft, your West Indies Porter or your foreign extra stout. Oh, um, five, two, zero, three, um, five. You can also um, that is, don't worry. <laughs> quite all right. Um, and you could have a Hop House 13 or you could have a Rockshore cider as well for those mm. who don't drink beer. because We do appreciate that not everybody is a beer drinker. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's it's great. And one of the uh, a product as well, which I think will go down really well. And we hope to have this ready around September. So target in 2023 will be utilizing our archives more. Honestly, if I told some of the people what we had in our archives, they would all be chomping at the bit to come over to Ireland. Um, so West Indies Porter, we actually have the original recipe book where Sir Arthur Guinness was writing his different recipes when mm. he was trying to create West Indies Porter in 1801. Um, we have obviously the original lease. Um, so this is probably a longer term product and wanting to create a bit of theatre around it um, because, you know, you can't just walk into a normal room to see the lease. You have to you have to feel like you're getting somewhere secret. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the, those are the products within the storehouse and within Open Gate Brewery. Um, so I really hope if there's any questions that I would be more than happy to answer them here. Um, but I will touch on lightly another one of our venues. So we are part of Diageo um, with the Irish brand homes. So our Irish brands, we are their, their brand homes. Um, and just actually, it's it's a lesser known, it's a lesser known brand, I suppose, from the, the 1800s. Um, and this is Rowan Co. Whiskey. So Rowan Co. Uh, just literally across the road from the Guinness Storehouse, um, you will find it being more widely known across the US markets this summer um, because we are launching our nationwide campaign. So it will be a more recognizable brand. So you will find that your US customers will recognize and want to know more about Rowan Co. And it's very distinctive, isn't it, Ashley? Like I always think it's whiskey meets Tiffany. It's a Tiffany color. The color it of is, the brand. Color. And what's actually really interesting, where that color comes from, it's this tar that you can see from gravity, but it's actually, it's copper, it's oxidized copper, that sort of green, that's the color it is actually coming from. It's the oxidized copper off the top of where they used to store um, all of the barley. So, and there was a pear tree at the bottom. Um, and so there are little, I suppose it's nods to the history. So in the 1800s, George Rowe was one of the biggest whiskey distillers um, in, in Europe. It was the largest distillery in Ireland. Um, and I suppose anywhere in the world, you would have, they knew, they would have been drinking a Rowe and Co or a George Rowe whiskey. So um, this only launched three, three years ago, four years ago, the whiskey itself. And in Ireland, to become an Irish whiskey, you have to be, it has to be distilled for three years and one day um, before you can call it an Irish whiskey. And that day is coming next January. When we, at the minute we have a blended whiskey, but next it'll be a single malt. Um, but they're really exciting whiskeys. They're constantly trying out new um, recipes, We've got one launch in next month, it's Kilahora, um, and it's where the whiskey has been distilled in cider barrels. So it's going to have a slight apple notes to it. Um, really exciting. We have the distillery across the way, and we do have a video we'll be able to show you on it as well, but we do cocktail classes. Um, the whiskey has been, it was, I'm going to get this room number wrong, room 103, because um, it was 103rd variation of the whiskey blend before they decided this was the one that was going to be Rowan Co. Um, mm. because it was the best tasting one in a cocktail. Um, so we'll give you a bit of a, a quick video if that's okay, and you'll be able to see Rowan Co. <laughs> So 
So yes, you may have seen that. That is me in the video. Um, our, our model pulled out in the last day, so I got pulled into the video. So um, here's truly showing you Row and Co. Um, and I think it's a great experience. Again, we've got our we've got our classes where you can do you can blend your own whiskey or you can create your own cocktail. Um, and we can also do these private, so um, you should be able to have it for your, your clients exclusively. So we would be delighted to, to welcome any of your clients across to Dublin um, and to Ireland as a whole and to, to experience the legacy of Guinness. Fantastic, thanks me and Ashley. We really appreciate that. So we've just come up to the time, the magic hour five. So uh, we'd like to thank all our presenters who joined us today. Uh, Selena, Louis, Shane, Karen, Ashley, am I leaving anyone out? They have covered everyone. Um, and then of course our own Geo um, who put everything together, especially in the, with the storm in the background. So she lost her power a few times today already. But uh, thanks a million for joining us. We'll possibly be back around the 9th of March for a St. Patrick's Day event. Um, and uh, then we'll also be having one in the future on Scottish women. Um, so we look forward to seeing you all again and thanks a million for joining us. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Gio. Bye, everyone.